Um, yeah, I think the button's ready when you are. 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 Hello and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode 160 for Thursday, the 1st of February, 2018. This is a show where two lifelong friends and their guests celebrate all things geek. I'm Amos. I forgot my headphones because I'm in a massive hurry all the time, every second of the day because I have kids. Kent, how you doing, man? Uh, great, man. This has been a long week. Uh, glad it's Thursday. It's Ritual Misery. We are not alone. We have a wonderful guest with us tonight, Hammond Chamberlain. What's going on, dude? Not much. I'm glad it's Thursday, too, because you know what Thursday is. It's uh, the day that wishes it was Friday. <laughs> ah, that is also true. <laughs> and it's Wednesday without the sexual innuendo. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> that that's that's true. I, I didn't really think about that yesterday. I probably should have. Um, hey, uh, <laughs> you, uh, you are not Diamond Club per se, which is, we're breaking a string here because we've had a string of Diamond Club people on. Um, you're like bona fide frog pants. I'm kind of Diamond Club adjacent. I've been on Cord Killers. I've done um, DTNS. I work on Current Geek, which has got Tom on it, and he's mm. very Diamond Clubby. So there's there's that. Uh, yeah, there's definitely some uh, some some creed to it. Um, yeah, I mean the Venn diagram covers both. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I think I think Scott s- Johnson referred to Diamond Club as the Skittles on the on the plate of gourmet food. <laughs> Actually, if you really look at it, the, the the night attack show is really the the yin to TMS's yang. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair assessment. Um, or wang, if you really want to get technical. I mean, yeah, it's that's I was gonna say, but um, hey, uh, <laughs> it's been uh, so. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in jump ahead real quick. It's been a crazy week. I don't think I've had much time to do anything other than than uh, play division because that ate up all my free time because it was a global event and that's really fun. Met a lot of great people online that I'll probably never see again in the game because, well, that's just how online games work. And um, I didn't really accomplish anything this week other than an, an EPR, which Kent, I'm sure you are fully aware of how painful that is. So that being said, we don't need to dwell on any of that. Kent, how was your week, man? <laughs> uh, well, I'm feeling old. My my youngest, I've been referring to him as my baby child, is now 14 years old. Uh, yeah, so he had his birthday this weekend. Uh, he got an Xbox. So we've been playing the hell out of some Xbox games. Uh, like what? Uh, primarily Killer Instinct. Which, to me, so we're a PlayStation household. We we were very much a Nintendo household, still kind of are, and, uh, you know, d- drifted into the Sony realm once PlayStation became a, a thing. I guess yeah. that's been quite a while now. Jeez, <laughs> probably, only Only most of your life. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, but yeah, we've been pretty loyal PlayStation players and haven't really done much with Xbox, but all of Isaac's friends are Xbox players, and he wanted to get into that world. Yeah. So we picked up an Xbox for him, and the only thing that Xbox had ever enticed me with in the past has been Killer Instinct, because it is, to me, by far, the best fighting game of all time. Okay. And I was super disappointed when the newest version came out a couple of years ago and they made it an Xbox exclusive. I was like, dang it. Okay. Uh, but I still, I still wasn't going to, you know, d- dish out several hundred dollars just to play that one game. Well, now that Isaac wanted an Xbox, we're like, okay, awesome. We'll get him an Xbox. But the deal is we have to get Killer Instinct. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's pretty much what we've been doing this week. And it's been awesome. I'm just glad. You know, it's good. It's funny you bring that up, though. My my oldest daughter, who is 13, uh, went out and used her Christmas money and bought a PlayStation 3, not a PlayStation 4, but a PS3, so that she could play uh, The Last of Us. Mm. That's the only oh. game we own. That's the only <laughs> thing she does. And she's now become very expert at uh, headshots. <laughs> well, good for her. About, I've learned all about clickers and runners and whatevers. Wow. Uh, but... I, I don't play games. We own a Switch. My youngest daughter plays the Switch, and my oldest daughter sits in my office and kills, you know, nearly dead folk with uh, Juno. <laughs> um, I, I will say that I, I've i struggled, especially first-person shooters, to find my niche. Because I'm, I'm not a Twitch player. I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to sit there and jump back and forth and, 
and all that other crap and try to avoid getting shot. I'm just, you know what? I just want to hunker down and shoot stuff and, and get to a, a goal, whatever the goal is. I have found that niche in the division. I think that's why I like this game so much and I haven't gone to other first person shooters and why I stick to this two coming on three year old game or whatever. I am a, an, an amazing sniper in that game. Like whatever, whatever, what, like the, you what? Doesn't say so himself. Yeah. I, and I only say yeah. that because people that I meet online, when I join their groups again, you know, these are people I've never met before other than playing the division. I join their groups again. And they're like, oh, hey, man, uh, you got your sniper? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got yeah. that. And he's like, okay, okay, make sure you got that ki- that kitted, man. That's why we invited you. We need a sniper. I was like, people are inviting me to the groups because I'm good at sniping. This is, all right, I found found something about this game that, that likes me. We used to call that camping. Right. Back, back in my heyday of, of first-person shooters, we, we used to call that camping, and that was like the, that was kind of an insult. Right. You know, and, and I've actually been kicked out of groups because they thought I wasn't doing damage. Not realizing that in in the division, say you got a, a the, the you got red, purple, and and yellow. Those are the three levels. Red are easy, purple are mediums, and yellows are the hard guys, right? Um, your purple guys will have about a million and a half hit points, and I'm doing a million hit points per hit. Oh jeez! So, geez. so okay. if I get a headshot, I'm I, I can sing I can single shot anybody up to yellow, and I can usually triple shot those unless they're a boss. So it looks like I'm not doing much because I'm not shooting very often. But when I hit somebody, more than half their life is gone if they're not just completely wiped. So, yeah. and it, it was just awesome when, when people were inviting me to their group because they needed a, a, someone to, for this mission to snipe. And I was like, hell yeah. All right, cool. I'm, I'm squishy okay. as hell. I'll die real quick if you start hitting me. But as long as I can stay back here and shoot. <laughs> yeah. So, Hammond, you're, you said you're not much of a gamer. What, what sort of geekiness have you gotten up, up to this week? Well, so this week I've been I well for the last few weeks for whatever reason I I get I did a show not too long ago called Retro Movie Geeks and they do this thing called um you know how Film Sack does Star Trek connections mm-hmm. well this show does Criminal Mind connections and so they were all talking ups unsubs and making all the jokes and so I jumped in and I've been been binge watching on Netflix Criminal Minds I'm now almost through I've got like a season and a half left and there's like twelve seasons wow and. Uh, yeah. I've actually kind of enjoyed it. There are a couple episodes that are a little bit far fetched. Like there's one where this guy turns people into marionettes, mm. uh, which is creepy and weird and off putting. But <laughs> a little it, bit, it, yeah. But it it's fine. It, most of the time, it's it's fine. It's been enjoyable. But yeah, I've kind of been digging on that. And then uh, as far as like movies and things, for some reason, I've been jo- going through a uh 60s and 70s giant japanese robot monster phase like i've been watching godzilla versus mangalon uh super inframan uh future ninja all these really dumb movies from like the 60s and 70s and just really really enjoying them that is awesome see i i love kaiju movies i i'm I'm in the same boat with that i i love godzilla uh king kong even for that matter but yeah all the old japanese stuff it's all pretty great um, Kent, yeah. how do you feel about Criminal Minds? Criminal Minds? Um, it's one of those shows that I've seen probably a dozen or so episodes, but never like, you know, one after the, I've never binged it. So uh, I've never watched it regularly, but it's, don't yeah, watch it's it right before you go to sleep. The reason I ask is because Hammond, you split us in half because I don't like kaiju movies. I think they're dumb. They're retarded. I don't watch them. I, if, if if they're on TV and it's at a fun part, I'll watch it. But as soon as the commercial hits, I'm out the door. Meanwhile, I too have binged many times Criminal Minds seasons. And oh yeah, I, I love the, the 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 intricacies of the stories. As far as like uh, those criminal stories, those those, those cop story, I think Criminal Minds is at the top of its game. I miss it when Mandy Patinkin was on. Um, I, I thought he was he was wonderful. Um, but I don't watch Kaiju at all. And I figured Kent would be the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah. So, Hammond, what do you think about Pacific Rim? Did you enjoy that movie? So I wanted to love Pacific Rim, but it took me two viewings to get through it. I had to stop. You know, there's that moment about midway through where they're sitting on the edge of the, the launch base watching the sunset. Mm, yeah, and it got, yeah. a little bit too, it got a little bit too fake emotional. That's where I tapped out the first time. Uh, second time I Second time I powered through it, and I enjoyed the giant monsters, but I don't care about any of the people. Yes. <laughs> no, I am in exactly the same boat. The visuals are 
amazing. Like, just give me a super cut of just the robot and kaiju scenes, and I'm good. Mm -hmm. I, don't, yeah. I don't care about Charlie Hunnam's character. I don't care about, like, any of those people. Just get rid of them and give me the robots and the monsters. That's the best part about those old Godzilla films is the humans were there just to get stepped on. Yes, <laughs> yes. They and point and scream. I mean, those, <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they weren't there for plot. They were there as casualty and collateral damage. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It is exactly what I wanted most of the humans in Pacific Rim to be. <laughs> uh, and just so, just so we're clear, uh, Sean Bean plays, he ends up the same in every movie. You know, that's, that's like, it's not true, but that's kind of like the, the theme, right? That's what I mean. Oh, you mean dead. Yeah, dead. dead. Um, <laughs> Charlie Hunnam is the same character in every movie. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah, like, basically. I mean, he's been in what? So, two movies? So so is Will Smith. So is um, Martin Lawrence. Mm. So Jean-Claude Van Damme and Rocky Rocky Balboa Man. And Sly I mean, Stallone. Going. Yeah. Uh, how about Arnold? I there yeah. were there were lines from um Arthur whatever Arthur movie he was in where he played Arthur, uh, it, the, I could have sworn were were taken straight from the Sons of Anarchy script. It was <laughs> it was wow. just completely awful. And of course my my wife and sister in law like oh he's so handsome oh he's such a badass I'm like and you won't watch Sons of Anarchy like that's all it is is him being this character for eight seasons. Yeah, see, I, I enjoyed Sons of Anarchy. I liked that I show too. quite a I bit. Even it. when it got, like, really weird and crazy, uh, I, I still enjoyed it. But I have no desire to see that dude in anything else. Right. <laughs> I, I, I got to be honest. I'm actually really worried about the next Pacific Rim film because they seem to be focusing more on people. Mm. And yep. I don't want that. I mean, you hired uh, freaking Finn. So, of course, we're going to focus more on people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't, need, I don't need Finn to be a hero. I just need his robot to be a hero. Right. Yes, exactly. And uh, the first trailer that came right. out for this, I yeah, I, I was like, oh, my God, this is going to be awful. Like, I couldn't get into that trailer whatsoever. This new trailer that just came out last week, I think it was, it's given me a little more hope. Yes, yeah. it is going to be character heavy more so than I want, of course. Uh, but I think the action... If there's enough of it, if it if it can outweigh the the uh, you know the supposed plot, then um, I I'm gonna be I'm gonna be good. I don't know. I like that I, supposed plot. Like there's not supposed to be a plot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't don't even pretend. Here, just just give me the fights. <laughs> here, I'll throw this out there. I had, I didn't think it was great, but I had a really good time at the new Power Rangers movie. Ah, really? I and, I, the, sound, and the silence was deafening. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I didn't even give that movie a second thought. I heard that it was coming out. I think I might have seen one of the trailers and then dismissed completely. So that's okay. It's I might have to check that out. It is, it is fun. It is not good. Don't take this as good. It is fun. And yeah. if you watch any Power Rangers at all when you were, you know, with the campy school stuff, like when we were younger, then it'll hit some chords with you that you probably will giggle some and have a good time with it. <laughs> Okay, I, yeah, I might check that out. In fact, when Twitch did their uh, their Power Rangers like uh, marathon stream, my mm -hmm. sons and I would would just turn it on randomly, and we'd sit for like forty five minutes just making fun of the <laughs> of the show. Yeah. So it, yeah, I can see it being fun. Yeah. Um, Amos, uh, Power Rangers. I, yes, I, I, no? I know that was totally my transition, and I literally <laughs> ate it. Um. <laughs> So Power Rangers is one of those shows that when I was when I was younger, I was just past the age where I would care about it. And when I got older, it was just under the age or just the Power Rangers was just a little bit older than my kids would have cared about it. So it yeah, it perfectly hit that generational gap. But I have heard the same thing that the movie, whether or not you like Power Rangers, is a fun watch. I've heard that from quite a few people actually. Okay. Right on. Uh if you guys think that Ritual Misery is a fun watch, you can head over to patreon.com slash Ritual Misery. Uh, if you enjoy us, let us know by giving us a buck. Uh, give a fuck and give a buck is kind of the, the phrase we've been throwing around for that. Uh, we also want to say thank you to all of our Twitch subscribers. Mm -hmm. uh, between our patrons and our Twitch subscribers, uh, you guys are showing quite a bit of appreciation to us, and uh, we definitely appreciate you guys. 
Yeah, and all that money goes to paying towards South by. So <laughs> it's definitely not it's not paying the bills yet, but uh it, it got us to South by, so we'll be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. That's coming up in uh what about three weeks, I think. Oh, is it only three, four weeks? Oh, oh uh, I'm nervous. I think it's four weeks. And uh yeah, we're definitely gonna be there. Uh guys, if you're gonna be in the Austin area in the first part of March, if you're gonna be there for for the live night attack and all of that sort of stuff, we will be having a meetup on uh 6th street at darwin's pub thursday night on thursday night the 8th is it sure i think so i'm pretty I think sure it's the 8th yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the same day of the week during the same festival at the same place and at the same time that we've been the last three years so yeah we'll be there absolutely so yeah it's gonna be a great time we're gonna have a, a meet up there probably gonna turn into a, a a pretty big deal uh brian and justin and tom and all, all the the usual suspects usually end up showing up at those things. We've been doing it for the last several years. Mm. Uh, it's a blast. We're going to do some games. We're going to have a good time. Um, w- at some point during the weekend, we may be doing something of a ritual misery specific event, mm. but uh, not ready to release any details on that. So stay tuned for for all of that. Not ready to release the details because we haven't made them up yet. <laughs> hey, hey, don't give away our secrets. That's behind the scenes information. <laughs> Oh yeah. So um anyway, we uh we we often bring guests on the show that we know a lot about. We often bring guests on the show that we think we know a lot about. This time we brought someone on that we knew your name, we had met you, we had talked with you, but we honestly didn't know a whole lot about you, which was awesome because that means we get to do research and we get to find out all this amazing stuff you're doing. And I gotta tell you, man, uh Soundography has been on my playlist. Like I've been wanting to wanting to listen, wanting to listen, wanting to listen, and just keep pushing it back, keep pushing it back. It was the first thing I did when I started actually like listening to stuff that you were doing and I never broke away. I'm like 10, 12 episodes in and I can't like I, I can't even listen to anything else other than soundography now. Like I'm stuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's really good to hear. I mean, right now we we just recorded the uh, first episode of season four uh, this last week. Uh, it's on Peter Gabriel and uh we are recording episode 2 this monday and it's on uh another band that you'll find out about <laughs> but never... they have 14 they have 14 albums so it's a big big listen for us oh for, but and see you do that all in one week right you listen to everything they've done that you can find that you can get legally get your hands on in in sometimes one week illegally, sometimes illegally i i <laughs> when we did kevin gilbert when we did mushroom head when we've done um iron maiden I have sources to stuff that, you know, you typically won't get. And when we did squeeze, Brian just kept unloading on squeeze. We had so much squeeze. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, well, so let's, let's start with soundography. Um, what was the original idea behind the show? So what happened was uh, for beyond the playlist with Jay Hammond, I had Brian on and I really just wanted to, and I interviewed him two or three times. We had talked, we'd found out that we both were fans of this guy named Kevin Gilbert. And so the two of us decided to get together and do kind of a playlist for Beyond the Playlist on Kevin Gilbert. And when the show was done, before I even encoded it and got it uploaded to be posted, Brian and I were talking about doing this kind of show on the regular because hmm. we clicked and we we tend to walk the same musical street for a number of years. In about 1984, 1985, he breaks one way and I break the other way. And so we have a lot of things in common, but we also have a lot of things where he knows things and uh, I know things and we don't know things. And so it kind of (laughs) works. And uh, so that's how it started. And we kicked around the idea for a while. Then we did the Kickstarter and we did the little pilot episode of uh, Alan Parsons Project. And then we did a we just started going and it it's been it's been now what two years, I guess, four seasons, three seasons with the fourth on the way and. It just keeps getting better and better and more and more fun. Yeah, that's awesome. I saw that you did the Beastie Boys, and um, Beastie Boys is one of my favorites of all time, and I cannot wait to dive into that. That's going to be awesome. Oh, so, so you haven't listened to that one yet, Kent? I have not. Oh, I, I, I literally finished listening to that just before I started our TED Talk for the night, like an hour before I had to go pick up the kids. It's It's... Ah, yeah. It, once in a while, I hear a show that I'm just like, I click completely. Like, I, I, so I listened to the Garth Brooks one. Garth Brooks is one of my favorite artists of all times. And it was the Garth Brooks one was done by two people that don't necessarily like country and still done respectfully and actually brought things into my mind that I hadn't heard of his before. 
And then oh, you like when I called him the Donald Trump of country music. <laughs> Um, there was a, a little fuzzy area right there that uh, <laughs> I don't I don't know what happened, but the the, you, the something of of uh, is like the the peachy keen guy of uh, of of country music. I don't know what happened. It was weird. It fuzzed out completely. <laughs> I might have been watching a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of Black Mirror too. So uh... <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, so Brian, you like uh, Brian? Jeez, not wow. not not Brian. We're talking to Hammond. Wrong, wrong co-host, uh, bald guy. So, so Hammond, yeah, the other bald guy. Um, you like listening to a lot of music. You like talking about music a lot. I heard that you are also a creator of music at times. Yeah. So I paid for some college uh, by playing harmonica professionally in bands, and uh, so I played harmonica. F- well, I played a lot in high school, but I didn't actually start getting paid for it until I was in college. And then uh, in, and I kind of stopped after I got married and got jobs where I was working in the evenings and things like that. But then um, in 2010, my wife bought me a Chapman stick. And uh, I've been learning how to play that for the last eight years. And I still suck at it very, very much. But it's fun to uh, pick up and whack on and, and play. And it's just an interesting instrument. So... So a He's Chapman show- stick is, it's kind of like the neck of a guitar, right? Yeah, it's basically what happens if a piano and a guitar had a baby. <laughs> okay. Um, so, like, I've I've never heard of these things until uh, I, I was reading up on some of the things that you've done in the past, and that's where I first heard of the Chapman stick. Uh, what, like, brought these into like, I guess the American music lexicon, like where did they come from? So there's a guy named Emmett Chapman who lives in California and he builds them by hand. They're like a boutique instrument. Um, they now have these aluminum ones called, uh, rail boards. And, uh, that's what I have because it's easy to stay in tune, but, uh, <laughs> they're gorgeous instruments. They are Uber, let, let, let the way they play lets you really mess with your creativity and actually changes the way you think about chord structure and music and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a great community of musicians. I've interviewed a bunch of them. I've interviewed a jazz musician who plays one. Uh, Greg Howard used to play with Dave Matthews. I've interviewed him. I've interviewed Chapman, Mr. Chapman himself, Emmett, that invented it. Um, the only one that I'm missing that I really would like to talk to is uh, Tony Levin, who plays with Peter Gabriel and... Um, uh, King Crimson. Hmm. Have you ever played on stage with one of these? Like, have you ever ever oh, performed wow. this, or is just a, just a solo thing? This is me in my in my office, banging around on music, trying to keep my brain healthy as I get older. Um, <laughs> <Got it. laughs> I'm I'm not sure if I'll ever play out with this. I still do harmonica stuff, but it's you know dumb like open mic stuff. But the Chapman stick is something that I don't think I'll ever get comfortable enough to go out and play. Uh, anywhere in front of people who actually might throw things at me. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you were when you were doing harmonica stuff regularly, was that like with uh, like gig bands, or were you recording, or, or what was your experience there? I did both. I actually did studio work. I played in a variety of different bands. I did country. I did rock and roll. I did blues. I did whatever. Um, I basically was like a musical prostitute. I just paid whatever they paid me to play. Got it. Yeah, I I know quite a few musical prostitutes, so <laughs> I get it. Oh man. Um. So what what do you see in the future? So you were saying the Chapman stick is just kind of like your personal, like private, whatever. Uh, what do you see in the future for maybe um you know more uh, harmonica work, or uh, do you see yourself doing anything? Uh, I guess in any other realm with music, as far as like a like a paying gig sort of deal. You know, I don't know. It kind of just depends. I'm damn near 50. I've got two kids. Um, and, you know, I I don't know. If something comes up and I get to play again, great. If I don't, I can still play for fun and sit on the porch and play with my nose in front of my kids for their friends and embarrass them and, you know, <laughs> do my do my John Popper impersonations and whatever I can, you know, whatever I can do to make myself happy. Uh, is, is that a blaster behind you? Yeah, it's a Battlestar Galactica blaster. I got it at Dragon Con a couple of years ago. Just noticing. <laughs> That's a random, <laughs> random answer. Well, I mean, I'm I'm officially done eating now, so I can actually engage fully in the conversation. Oh, look the raccoon, the raccoonicorn, as created by JF DeBeau. <laughs> raccoonicorn, yes, I love it. <laughs> That's just not right. 
Um, okay, so you have other things going on right now besides uh, besides playing the Chapman stick in, in the privacies and uh, uh, playing the harmonica when you're forced to in public uh, and recording soundography. Um, you have like like big things going. And one of the things that, that Kent and I like to do, because we've seen enough of it in our military careers and in, in our lives and with our friends and things like that, we like to bring um, bring up good causes and things that people are doing that are actually making the better, just the, making the world just a little little less sucky uh, <laughs> for for some sort of people. Um, you happen to be involved in a huge project to do just that. Yeah, we. So I spent most of my career working in and around corrections, uh, doing you know crisis work, rehab stuff. Uh, I've worked with both adolescents and juveniles. Uh, I did, you know, pretrial and probation supervision for a long time. And, uh, I decided that, you know, having resources for people who can't either afford them or can't get to them because, you know, resources are kind of slim pickings sometimes creating an online sober living community, kind of like a sober house would be a good thing. So my wife and I started climb out network and it's a online sober living community. And then there's a show called climb out to sobriety that we do. Um, we actually, you know, we had a really serious hack right before Christmas and, uh, we just got our, our legs back to us, uh, this last week to get a show back out. Wow. But, uh, it crippled us. It was, I mean, it's a two person operation and it just crippled the crap out of us. And, uh, but you were back and shows are going to be coming out on a regular basis again, but we have three really, uh, qualified, amazing therapists that do shows with us and they rotate through so we can get kind of different voices and different opinions. Um, my wife participates doing shows. I, you know, moderate and participate in shows because of my experiences. So, um, yeah, we're just trying to create resources and opportunities to help kind of help people maintain sobriety after treatment. That's kind of our, our sweet spot is that idea of you're out of treatment, you're brand new to it. You don't know what to do. We have some options and some answers to help you out. Now, is this sobriety just from alcohol or can this apply to drug use and things like that? Yeah, we, we cover all the bases. I mean, we, our first episodes or, you know, first few episodes are basically just kind of like community and how it can affect you. And then we, uh, are doing things about the 12 step programs. And then we're doing things about how to, uh, what smart recovery is and how, what harm reduction is. And, and some of these other things that are out there just to kind of give people options because not every, not every kind of method will match every other person. So one of the things that we, since we have three different therapists and different points of view is their clinical experience comes in and helps guide these conversations. So that's kind of how we, that's kind of how we work together. Yeah. I think this is great. This is, this is something that, that someone can become a part of and just kind of like, you know, for the rest of your life, like lifelong, uh, like, like a journey, basically it's, it's a journey for the rest of your life. Uh, the path to sobriety and, uh, and all that I I've seen many times in the past where, People will go to rehab, they'll get sober, and they'll be sober for you know several months or whatever. But as soon as, as soon as they're not being paid attention to anymore, they slip back into their their old ways and find the bottle again. Uh, and I, I've seen that with drugs as well. And so this is great if, if someone can become a part of this community. And I, I imagine that they would they would find a sense of belonging in in group in this group. Yeah, and, um, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where everybody's been touched by this one way or another. We're in a we're in a point in time where we all have a friend, we all have somebody. We in some cases it's us who have done things and had had experienced loss or tragedy or whatever based on this problem. And so it's a very common thing. And finding places where you can be honest and talk about it in real ways, like we did a two part series of episodes on how families f it up, mm. f up <laughs> sobriety. And, and the idea is that families are doing everything they can to help you, but in the long run, sometimes that help can actually be damaging. So we kind of talk about ways that families kind of F it up, both in, in treatment, before treatment, and after treatment. Yeah, I mean, sometimes your family's why you drink. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we, we spend a lot of time being very honest about the fact that, you know, families are, they're all love and good intentions, but sometimes that goes sideways too. Yeah, definitely. Um one of, one of the things that we we always touch on whenever we get the chance is depression and how how that can have such a how 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 often it happens to people and how it can affect people and how it's hard to get out of that cycle as well. Um, 
I'm sure there's a lot of correlations between depression and substance abuse that I don't have facts and figures for that I could probably look up real quick if I wasn't so lazy and busy talking. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the things that, that any, you know, we, I've, I've had recently, I say recent, but it feels like it was yesterday, but it was actually like six years ago. I had a friend of mine that uh, killed himself because I don't know why. And that's, that's one of the things that gets me is it, well, he hung himself because I, and I don't have that answer. So yeah. it's constantly, uh, it's a constant reminder to me, and I try to keep Kent in the loop, and he's got his own, his own things, especially, you know, with some of the friends he's had and things. that uh, it, It's something that, that I keep on the mind, and anytime there's someone that's down, and, you know, if, if they're hitting, a, like, if you're one of those people that's constantly down, like, I don't, I don't, I got nothing for you. I, I, it's not that I don't care, it's just that I don't have, I haven't developed. You don't have the, the tools. Yeah, I don't have the skill set to, to help you out of that, you know. Um, but I do keep an open mind, especially when there's someone who's usually pretty chipper and then all of a sudden they either drop off the face of the earth or they're suddenly very angry or very sad and it's an extended period. I keep that in, in, in very, you know, I keep that close to heart because I want to talk to them. I want to make sure they're not going down a certain route that I don't, I don't want them to go down or whatever. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of parallels to that between, you know, between recovering from depression and recover, recovering from, from substance abuse. And I'm sure they're very intermingled, like I said before. Yeah, well, we we did an entire episode about suicide, um, uh, uh, not too long after we got started, and uh, we talked about it in kind of a, a very frank way, but we also was very were was very respectful about it. Um, and then we also did um, an episode on uh, how there's a uh, addiction can be almost a symptom of other issues, so like depression or. PTSD or some of these other things. And so we spent a lot of time talking about these things and, um, it's, it's all, there's the diagnosis. Addiction is a symptom. If you roll back up some, then you'll get to the suicide. A score. That's interesting too, but it's there. Um, but yeah, those are, I mean, it's all things that are, uh, you know, very helpful and very, uh, ha intermingled. I mean, we, we spend a lot of time, uh, working, like I work in, I do contract work right now within a, an adolescent place and we are dealing with trauma and, uh, victimization and depression and violence and all these things that these kids have been part of and witnessed. And you, we just have, you know, it ties so much into their own, you know, drug use and their own damage and stuff like that. Um, do you if you can, because I, I feel the need, and this is just my 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 interview skills failing me here, but um, I feel the need. Like, do you have a specific success story that you can share with us? Uh, you know, it's funny because when I did crisis work at the jail, the only stories I got to know about were the ones when I failed. Because mm. if I kept alive, they were still there the next morning to be mad at me that they were in jail. Mm -hmm. Uh when I failed, there was usually, you know, paperwork and police and investigations and court and all that kind of stuff. And so my success stories are not probably what typically success stories are because my, my view of success was very skewed early on. I mean, I went right from college doing crisis work. I was in my early twenties. So the idea of being able to just survive in the environments that I was in, um, was a struggle. So, for me, having people who can have any kind of success of any level and any kind of uh, duration of time and make their lives even a little better, I consider a win. So if it's a kid who gets out of a dangerous situation, gets healthy, and then learns how to deal with that situation, that's a win. If it's an adult who gets out of a situation and was able to move and be sober and make new friends and learn how to socialize again as, an, as, a, as a sober person, then that's a win. Um, you know, I've literally had contact with hundreds and hundreds of people over my career and very few of them I get to keep track of because of, you know, confidentiality and the, the kind of very short, but very intense interactions I have with them. And so, you know, if I don't see them, like when I would see kids in the adolescent facility and I wouldn't see them in the jail as they got older, I'd consider that a win. Mm. But when I did see them in the jail, I just point and giggle because I told them that this was going to happen. <laughs> Right, right. It's either you win or you're right. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. I imagine that that you 
are an inspiration to a lot of people. And I was just wondering who inspires you? Oh my gosh. Uh, mostly it's my kids and my wife. I'll be really honest. If it weren't for them, I mean, my wife is the rainbow and unicorn person. She, her world is so happy and bright and normal and everyone's out to do good in the world. And I'm just, everyone's up to something. Everyone's got a motive. Uh, everyone's got an angle. Tears are manipulative. I mean, <laughs> when, my, when my kids cry, all it does is piss me off because they're, they're just trying to get over on me. And with, so, and it, it's hard because I have two girls. So that happens a lot. And all uh, I do is get angry. <laughs> you, you just described my family so perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> So, but really when it comes down to it, I really, my whole goal is that, uh, I want people to, when they think of me either to not say something horrible or to at least laugh a little bit because of something they remember I said. Mm. So if that's, that's a pretty easy bar. And one year I actually made a new year's resolution just to be nicer. Mm. And so I made it very vocal. So people at work would hold me to it. Like, Hey, your goal is to be nicer. Don't be a jackass. <laughs> and so I would have to be nicer, but really it's my wife and kids. I just want them to be able to be proud of who I am and, and what I do. And, and why did you get into crisis management, especially so early? Uh, I was an advertising major in college. And then I had a friend of mine steal an idea like from, from me in class and register the idea, kind of copyright the idea with the teacher before I could get to it. I'm like, that's too cutthroat for me. I need something that's going to be a little nicer. So I transferred over to sociology and I got a sociology degree. And uh, as I was getting ready to graduate, I got a job working at a prison and I realized that I just wasn't quite wired to search people. Like searching grown men does not, it's not something I'm super comfortable with. I'm not a touchy guy. So looking at people's butts and sacks and stuff wasn't where I was at. So I saw the uh, thing for the crisis work job and I applied for that and got it. And I did that for the next six years. Wow. I, I mean, that, that's better than me and Kent. We were like, Hey, we don't want to go to school anymore. Let's jump in the air force and see what, where it takes us. <laughs> My dad Pretty was much. air force. I was, I was raised as an air force brat. So I totally know what that world is like. I went to 14 different schools in 11 years of school. Yeah. I, I, uh, I heard on one of the episodes where you were, you were riding around, I think it was the beastie boys one where you're riding around Hickam, uh, going yep. out to K Bay and stuff like that. And, and you, you were one of the cool kids or whatever. And I was yeah. thinking, man, there were no cool kids on Hickam. They were all away from the base. Like, uh, <laughs> no, we had, we had some cool kids on base when I was there. When were you there? Uh, 2004 to 2008. Oh, okay. See, I was there in, uh, 87 through 80, no, 86 through 88. Mm. Cause yeah. I'm significantly older. <laughs> and you're not you're far not. from Hill Air Force Base now, right? I'm about an hour and a half from Hill. Okay. Okay. I, yeah. I thought you were a little bit closer. I was wondering if, if, uh, you ended up in the Salt Lake area because of the Air Force. No, no, no. I ended up in the Salt Lake area cause I went to college a little bit South of here. And then I got a, a, went to school again at the University of Utah um, after I did crisis work to get a second, kind of get my foot back into theater and stuff. So, but yeah. Wow. What, what was your, uh, what was your favorite place to be when you were growing up uh, as a military brat? I really enjoyed Rhein-Main Air Force Base, which is gone now. They mothballed it. It was in Germany. I was there. Then, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just before they closed it down, I, I stopped there for a 23-hour layover after spending my 21st birthday in the sandbox. So I oh, remember, wow. I remember about this much of it. Uh, yeah, I was, I was there from 79 through 81. I was there for third, fourth, and fifth grade. Wow. Yeah, I, um, and I had a similar experience as Amos. I was at Rhine Mine for like uh, I don't know four hours or something like that on the way to the sandbox, mm. and I. When I saw Germany, that was my first experience seeing Germany. When I saw it, I was like, yep, I'm going to live here someday. And I, <laughs> I put that number one on my dream sheet. It took me about eight more years, I think, to get to Germany. But I, I spent five years at Spengdalem Air Base. Okay. And um, it is by far my, my favorite place that I was ever stationed in the Air Force. I, Germany is fantastic. And then the other place I put on the list, too, is Northern Virginia. My dad was stationed at the Pentagon for a number of years, and we lived at Fort Belvoir, which is an army base, but they happen to have this weird little air force installation on the military, on the, uh, army engineering base. Hmm. And then, uh, we lived just 
off base a little bit too, and he was stationed at the Pentagon. So Northern Virginia is also really nice too. Mm. My uh, yeah. my favorite would be Hickam because I just love the island. It's just I, I, I'm 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 only sad that I didn't see more of Hawaii. And so my good. I spent two and a half years there, mm-hmm. and after and I got my driver's license there. So when you get your driver's license in Hawaii, you want to just drive and drive and drive when you get your license. Well, two and a half hours after you start, you're back right back where you freaking started. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. yeah that's about how okinawa was yeah and then and then you end up after about i was there for, like i said two and a half years it ends up being like alcatraz in technicolor because you're yeah. trapped and you're paying 14 dollars for a gallon of milk yeah i was well i left okinawa after being there for four years with kent for most of it uh to go to hawaii so we went from a, 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 this island that was just really long that had one road that went up down the middle of it to an island where you could drive around the edges, well, most of the edges, when by the time I got there, like the, the westernmost tip had already fallen in, so you couldn't go that way. But you could dr- at least drive, you know, the, the two-hour loop around the middle part and stuff. And, man, I, 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 th- I had island fever in Okinawa. Then I got to Hawaii, which is actually smaller. Oahu is smaller than Okinawa. And I didn't have island fever anymore because I could drive in a circle. Yeah. Because Okinawa, you could just uh, drive up one road, and then you yeah. had to come back that same road. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, with a I, with a stoplight every fifteen seconds, it seemed like. I really, I really enjoyed going to the Big Island because it's the size of Utah, and mm. it's got a big old Parker Ranch in the middle, and the, and Mauna Kea, and the observatory, and all kinds of yeah. stuff. So you can really kind of get lost on the Big Island, which is great. But, man, Oahu is just a big, dirty city for the most part. Yeah. Honolulu is just, it's. I mean, and then of course you got the jokes. They have, interstate highways, mm. on an island. Yeah. Well, the interstate and and uh, <laughs> so, so you have h1 h2 and h3 h3 uh-huh. connects h1 to the backside of h1 and h2 uh-huh. kind of goes off off to the to another area it, it does it ends up like in nowhere you can kind of loop yeah. around, back around to h3 if you want but they don't it's yeah it's awful and then and then my favorite part though is you know like i live in a city now in salt lake where there is a million different ways to get anywhere so if <laughs> the traffic shuts down Going on the highway, you can take surface streets. If those surface streets are plugged up, you can take other surface streets. You can go a million different ways to get somewhere. In Hawaii, there is one way to get anywhere. Yeah. If that road shuts down, you are stuck where you were sitting until it's it's figured out. I was amazed in Hawaii that okay. So I grew up in Southern California, mostly Indiana, some of the the older years. Um, but if you get off on an exit, there's an on ramp at that same location. So if you can remember how where you were when you got off the highway you can remember how to get back on the highway, go in either direction, you're mm-hmm. fine. Hawaii, not so much. The, the numbers, the exits don't match the on-ramps, and they don't match each. <laughs> like, you might be able to exit and go south, but you can't exit that same exit and go north without going south and doing a U-turn. And then oh, yeah. you can't get back on the freeway at that point. You have to go, down, like, a half a mile either direction to get back on the freeway. Like, it, I've, I left Okinawa, Okinawa, Japan, where it's just completely overpopulated. There's... If you have grass in your yard, it's because it's a weed creeping through the concrete. Um, <laughs> Basically, and, yeah. And weed creeping through the concrete. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, and I get to Hawaii where there's this all this beautiful greenery and nobody can drive. Like, <laughs> oh, spirit of Aloha. Yeah, you, you turn your blinker on and people are like giving you the bird. Like, what are you trying to do? Be special? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you say if that one road breaks down, at, at one point uh, going around the stadium on H1, a crane they were they were driving or towing a crane down h1 to go to north shore i think to go to kebe and it the crane wasn't lowered enough so it was hitting the signs and at, at one point it eventually hit a walking path over the over the highway well when it hit, did that it collapsed it so it shut down h1 around in right in pearl city where there again you can't get off here and get on there you got to get off here go two miles down this way hook a jabby and come around here you know and, and finally get back on and then you're facing the wrong direction um, so it shut it down there for an entire night. Like they closed the entire freeway down at four o'clock in the afternoon. So the only other way to go around is to go North shore, go all the way around K Bay, come all the way around the other side. And people were just like, you know what? I'm sleeping on my car. It yep. didn't clear up for a day and a half. People oh, were yeah, stranded no. there for a day and a half on the freeway. Yeah, I can totally get it. And they probably didn't care. They probably just left their cars, walked down to their friend's house because they're all related. <laughs> Everyone's a cousin. Yeah. I dated a girl for a while and when we broke up, I just moved because I didn't want people to hate me. 
<laughs> oh, well, they are, they hated you already because you're a Holly. So actually, I actually I got off pretty easy. My dad dropped me off my first day. Uh, we lived there and said football camp has started. You're going to be play, playing football. So they dropped me off, and I happened to be actually pretty good at what I was doing. And so I earned the respect of the football players over the course of the summer during the football camp. And when school started, I already had an end with all the people who had any kind of pull with the school. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what you got to do. Yeah. Hey, um, th- we, uh, we said we did some research on you, and we, we did. We, we dug in deep. We went trash diving. We hit, we, at Nerdtacular, we made some contacts there in Salt Lake City. And, uh, we, you know, we, we, we looked through city archives and everything else, and and maybe may, we might we might I'm not saying we weren't responsible for the hack earlier uh, a couple months ago, but but you know what we found some stuff we we found we found an amazing an amazing document, and um, we're gonna go ahead and, and share it with you now because I don't think I don't think a lot of people have seen this, and it's yeah. and it's sad. Um, yeah. So, what am I looking at? What am I gonna see? Uh, well, we're gonna uh, read it to you. I'm a little terrified. Yeah. Um, for well, the- actually, while while Amos gets that set up, actually, Amos, why don't you go ahead and play the uh, the sounder for the other segment so that we can transition Th- this one from here that into the into the hack. So here on the Ritual Misery podcast, we like to listen to ted talks and review them and when we can we like to give our guests the opportunity to suggest one that they have enjoyed hammond you chose something that is very similar to a ted talk but is not part of the actual ted conference and uh would you like to tell us a little bit about terry gunn and uh what what he does or uh, sorry trey yes trey uh trey gunn what he does and uh what message he was trying to communicate so trey gunn's a musician he plays one of these type style instruments he started playing the chapman stick but he now he, i think he plays a war guitar which is a very similar but they're more expensive and bigger and have more strings it, it had like 45 and, strings it was ridiculous yeah it's it's nuts they have i think his has 14 or 15 strings or something stupid i just it's insane but anyway his whole gist was about how to develop an original creative voice and how everyone has the ability to do it They just have to be able to learn how to tap into it and nurture it and work with it. So um, I listen to this probably – I probably pull it up about once a year just because it it really – I need this and it really helps kind of inspire me to kind of keep working and looking at things because when you feel like you've done it all or when you feel like you're kind of tapped out, going back and hearing him talk about how you can kind of reach back into some of those uh, other sources and resources are actually – it's actually really good to hear. And it's 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 a good it's a really good talk. And I was really surprised when I looked it up again for this show that it wasn't a TED talk, because mm. it sure feels yeah. like one. It does. Yeah, absolutely. It's got exactly the same feel. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting the way that he explained like original voice, like what it is, how you find it. Uh, uh, basically, the way that he was saying it, like, uh, don't rip people off. Like, don't be a genre artist. Mm. Like he had nothing good to say about genre artists. Um, but I, I really liked how, how he related it to everyone. He of course is a musician and he spoke a lot in, in musical terms, but what he was actually saying, his message applies to any creative field, uh, music, filmmaking, uh, writing, you name it, it will apply. And, uh, I really, really, really enjoyed this talk. This thing, it's actually, it's kind of long. It's almost 30 minutes long. And it didn't feel like it to me. It went by so fast. It felt like it was 10 minutes, maybe. Well, so because once the music ended and he started talking, I hit it on one and a half speed because I'm just used to listening to people at one and a half speed because of podcasts. Um, so it, it definitely wasn't 30 minutes for me. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, I, I was watching this day. Kent had already said, hey, man, it's a little bit long. You might want to make sure you have time because we are notorious for not having time to finish the TED Talk that each other chooses or whatever else or can't throw in a four minute one in there, you know, um, today during my downtime, cause I ha- I take breaks. Like I'm, I'm home all the time cause I'm on the sick leave. So I'm basically home all the time. There's certain points where I'm just like, you know what? I need to unplug and just kind of zone out. So I'll YouTube and I was catching up on my Peter McKinnon today. Peter McKinnon is a photographer who eventually I would love to have on the show. He's a Canadian photographer. And one of the things that he talks about is it's not just, Oh, here's the photo- photography I do. Here's the trip I did. 
uh, on a regular basis, he brings other people in that are doing really cool stuff. And in this particular episode, he had a guy that d- the sketches like words, like he does word art just off the, okay. uh, you know, Hey, there's a wall. I've got a pencil. I'm going to pencil in some word art, take some Sharpies, fill it in. Now you've got a piece of, of word art on your wall. And um, they kind of went through this, there's like two videos between him and the other guy, because I kind of followed him too, you know, it was pretty good stuff. And they were they were going over some of the things that, that helped them like keep it in mind to be creative and how to be creative and stuff like that. And then, so I'm watching that, and I actually t- took notes down of what, you know, some of the stuff I was getting from the other videos, because I'm always trying to find some inspiration to be a little more creative, be more productive, get things out there, because I got 10 million ideas in my head, and no proper way to to express them because I'm, I'm not overly musical and I can't draw for crap. So, um, <laughs> thus I do more podcasts than I should. And, um, <laughs> I, uh, I wrote all this down and, and right after that I transitioned, I was like, Hey, before I click off YouTube, um, I know there's this Ted talk I need to watch. So I click over and I'm watching it and it fills fits right in with all the videos I'd already seen today. Like it was, it was like this natural transition, like, Oh, here's some artistry and here's some photography and well, here's some music. And it, it was, clear and and i i enjoyed it the guy this guy trey when he speaks it's not like droning on he knows how to use inflection as a voice and it kept me interested and engaged and i i enjoyed it i really really liked it. i liked the message i liked the guy i even liked the song he played at the beginning which at first was a little off-putting because i was like what the hell is he doing right there oh <laughs> i has got a groove all right cool all right yeah yeah, the thing at the beginning was pretty cool. I really like what he did th- did at the end, where he was creating his own loops and just kept building and building and building. Uh, it basically, sounded like he was playing with an entire band, but it was just it was just him. Yeah, well, and, uh, as he was building great. building out of his toolbox. Yeah, and that, that was yeah. funny. He pulls out this big sheet of paper and he's like, "This is my toolbox. It could be yours, but it has my name on it or whatever." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, <laughs> this one's mine." Uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. And um, yeah, that's that's Trey Gunn. Uh, yeah, if you want to YouTube, Trey Gunn speaks on original voices, the name of the, the talk, uh, we'll, we'll definitely include a, a link in the show notes for that. Um, Amos, did you, did, were you, were you able to, to pull up that, uh, I was, thank you for uh, from the hack. Th- thank you for the stall. That was, uh, I, so, I, I tried to open it up and it didn't open. I was like, Oh, this is not going to be good. Um, <laughs> so I got it to work. Ah, crap. The bit won't work. Um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> So Hammond does research for soundography. It's one of the things that he does, and he's pretty good at it. He's, he's pretty in-depth. I'm surprised half the time that you can get as much information as you can, but I, I don't know how much time you spend into it, but it would take me a long time to get the information you get. Um, but Hammond does research for, for soundography, and sometimes he runs out of time to proofread his summaries. Um, and what we have here is an excerpt of uh, an unaired episode from season one of soundography. And this, these are raw notes. These have not been re-edited. You can tell they're they're not re-edited. It's it's kind of little little back and forth out of the out, off the wall here. Um, he says, uh, "Pirates love to sing touchy headshots called limericks. Here are two favorites, usually on the tip of every pirate's sack. <laughs> A pretty Chapman pirate named Alice broke into the king's original palace. She caused an." Tapped out scene, but soon she became queen, that pretty important pirate of malice. And here's the other one. There once was a prison named Billy. His blaster mates considered him quite silly. He'd work up the mast while shouting a vast as the ship listened to Philly. Um, yeah, that sounds like some pretty rough notes. Um, I see why that was cut from the episode. I, I want to know what the episode was because we only got we only got like a, the middle part. We didn't like what what episode was that from, Hammond? That was our that was our Duran Duran episode. Ah, oh, <laughs> you know that that's that it all makes sense. It does. Now. It really fits in now. It's all it's all Duran Duran because <laughs> they were hungry like a wolf, uh, uh, and their uh, their mouth was uh, wet, wet like wine, juices like wine, wet, wet with juices like wine. Yeah, mouth no mouth is alive with juices like wine. There we go. I'm gonna get the lyric eventually. And then he did that infamous cover of nine one one is just a joke. Uh. Just let if that. that exists, I'm sure Brian has it somewhere. Oh, it exists. We played it on the show. <laughs> oh my god. Um doing nine one one is just a joke. It's I, there. I uh I, I realized today when I was going through my YouTube and trying to catch up on some of the videos from the people that I subscribe to that I've, that I've kind of, you know, let go by the wayside during my week of massive nothing to nothing, no time to myself. 
I I really really enjoy a 9/11 11 conspiracy. Like oh. I will rewatch conspiracy videos about 9/11 over and over again and I I enjoy them every single time uh, at varying levels of seriousness. You know, sometimes I'm just laughing at them, sometimes like that's a good point, but I always so enjoy it. <laughs> there's a show that there's a show that I listen to here called Area 52 podcast and it's it's locally done and it's uh, a couple people I know and somebody else and uh it's a conspiracy show. And not too long ago, they did an episode about sports conspiracies. And it was the most fascinating episode of that ep show ever. Wow. Because I'm, I'm kind of a, a, a sold on the fact that sports are kind of entertainment and not sport anymore. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more entertainment than competition. It's more WWE yeah. than uh, yeah. state championship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, speaking of which, did you he did you guys hear that the XFL is coming back? Yes. Yes. I'm thrilled. Hell yeah. <laughs> I can't <gasps> wait for Trump. I can't wait for Trump to own another football team. For who? Trump's <laughs> out again. He owned one of the XFL teams, like a New Jersey Gamblers or something. It just keeps fuzzing out when you say like it's weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a uh, it's weird. It's like a sunspot or something. That's uh, <laughs> uh, a <laughs> but yeah, it's no, a, it's that's a bright like, orange I'm sunspot. I'm fascinated to see what this thing is going to become. I, uh, I mean, it was such a colossal failure the last time, but it was still yes. like it was just so quirky and. Odd. It was entertaining. Well, this it's, this time it's he's he's McMahon's going at it with a little bit more seriousness. Like, you know what? We want to actually bring genuine sport into this, not just be an entertainment platform with some athletes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he, yeah, he's wanting to take it a little bit more seriously. He's taking a little bit more time to develop it. He's taking two years instead of just you know throwing it out of his pocket one weekend. Um, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. I, I think it could be fun. Plus, the cheerleader outfits were always amazing. Well, and I hey. also think he wants to bring the head trauma back into football. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um uh, you yeah, almost make, you make almost got a screen. Again. You almost got a screen full of Mountain Dew. <laughs> <laughs> hey Hammond, uh I've got a question from the from the Twitch chat from Mbeam. He wants to know has soundography done or do they plan on doing an episode on craft work? You know, it's yeah, on our list. Like the German uh, it's, prof, not, prof, it's, it's not it's on the long term list. It's not something we've got for season four. Uh, but it is something that Brian and I both uh, have talked about because we both have a, a very weird, uh, hidden love of craft work. Hmm. Well, okay, so besides besides your uh, your your obvious entrance into uh, you know Patreon.com slash Soundography, uh, it, it, way to get people to choose things. What is your actual like process between you and Brian to choose? We're gonna do an episode on this and this, but not this. So what we usually do is we have, a, we have a list of literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bands. And we go through, and I pick the two or three metal and or progressive bands, and I'm not allowed to talk anymore while he fills in the rest. <laughs> I mean, that's as bad as democratic as you can make it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, is your, what is your favorite band of all time, if you had to pick just one to, to listen to? Oh, gosh. Probably Dream Theater, Mushroom Head, something like that. I don't know, one of those two. Wow. How about you, Kent? Uh, my favorite band of all time? Mm -hmm. If you could only listen to one one band uh, forever. One, oh my God. See, that's hard because music to me, it kind of helps a mood. It like perpetuates a mood. Mm. And I'm not always in the same mood or in the, in the mood to be in that mood or whatever the case. Um, but if I just had to pick one I'm forever, not in the mood for I, I think I'm going to have to say Beastie Boys because they're, they can put me in all sorts of different moods. Hmm. I would go. Uh, I would go Metallica just, just because most and, of most of my moods sync with those songs. Yeah, and especially Saint Anger, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I might not even take Saint Anger or anything after that. Just uh, just no, stop it, reload. On. You have uh, to tell me that uh, Death Magnetic is actually a pretty good album. Uh, you, uh, okay, so this is about the time that I, I I admit that I've only actually listened to the album one time all the way through and wasn't really struck by anything in particular. Yeah, you should, that, okay, so you know how I love magnetic, how I got appreciate pre for Death Magnetic okay. was I watched their three D their three D movie the Through the Never yeah, and they play some of those songs live in that film and I got a appreciation for them. Yeah. Just like I hate I hated all of Saint Anger until I saw some kind of monster mm. and I went back and I'm like oh okay so there are a couple songs on this album that don't actually totally suck yeah they're all in the first half but yeah um they, <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. I, 
Uh, but see, I'm I'm the rare Metallica fan that's actually willing to admit that Load and Reload are my favorite two albums. Actually, my favorite Metallica song of all times off Reload. What is it? Where the Wild Things Are. Oh yeah, mine mine's a uh, mine's Fixer. Oh, that's a good one. Oh. Now, Where the Wild Things Are is one of like Jason Newstead's few writing credits in his mm-hmm. entire tenure in Metallica. <laughs> And, and that's the uh, departure. <laughs> I freaking love that song. Yeah. Yeah. I, those, those two albums are, cause my, one of my daughters, uh, she's 15 and she was, she was doing a, uh, uh, a report, you know, I have to do a review of my favorite 10 songs from whatever band or my favorite 10 paintings or favorite, whatever, whatever. And so she chose a, a band and she was like, well, I like some Metallica and you know, my dad can help me with the rest of it. So she did the top, her top 10 songs from Metallica. And I looked at it. And of course, she starts with one because one has to be number one, right? That's just how that works. Um, you know, I kind of disagree. I don't like one very much, right? But just because the number one has to be one, that's that's her whole me- whole reasoning behind it. Um, and she kind of teenagers, went, yeah, yeah, exactly. She went down the list, and and there's a few of them. I was like, but have you? She, I noticed there's nothing off Load or Reload. There's nothing off of like Saint Anger or anything else. I was like, have you listened to this song? Have you listened to this song? And I start pointing out all these songs. There's nothing from Master of Puppets, which would. Man, if I had to just pick one album, like a single album, that would have to be it just because it's driving the entire time. Um, even though Load and Reload would be a better pair against it. But anyway, uh, like I, it got me in this mood to listen to all this Metallica, and that got me in the mood to listen to all this Guns N' Roses. And I started, I've been on this like this ni- 80s, 90s m- metal kick, this, this rock kick, like for weeks now. Oh, I'm Guns sorry, about Roses Guns metal, Roses. <laughs> uh, no, Guns N' Roses is not metal. They are rock. And man, when I was younger, Kent and Jeremy used to ride me about how I I loved Axl Rose and how they hated him because his his voice is nasally and he can't sing and he's never on key and blah 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 blah. And I thought they were complete bullshitters until about two weeks ago, and now they're completely right. Although I still like his songwriting skills. So here's my thing about him is I've always like I was raised by parents. My dad was at the Monterey Rock Festival, Monterey Pop Festival. My dad was an acid rock guy growing up. Mm-hmm. My mom was an R&B person. And I remember when, when Welcome to the Jungle first came on, my mom walked in and said, he sounds just like Janis Joplin. And I'll be damned if he doesn't. Yeah. So every time I oh, see him, wow. I'm always thinking, man, he's just Janis Joplin in uh, straight clothes. He's in drag kind of because he's <laughs> just Janis Joplin. Yeah. Um, I mean, now he's two Janis Joplins. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. Anyway, I, I could go on and on about Axl Rose and, and Guns N' Roses and and and. Have the, you read Slash's book? I have not. You need to read Slash's book. Also, read Dave Mustaine's book. It's really good too. Mm, I've, I've mm. read ex- excerpts from that one, but mostly centered around his time with Metallica. But yeah, I, I didn't realize Mustaine had a book. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's awesome. It's it, a great if, book. And if he, you've ever OD'd, if you've ever played music and then OD'd, you have a book. I guarantee it. It's <laughs> if you're still the alive. One want, the one that's on my list to read, but I just can't bring myself to do it yet is Stephen Piercy from Rat. I just can't do it. Mm. Rat uh, would be one of Molly Wood's favorite favorite uh, artists or bands of all time. <laughs> I, I, hey, Invasion of Your Privacy still stands out as one of my great my greatest albums on my list of my childhood. Mm. But oh, you want to talk I about can't... you want to go childhood, man? Cinderella, that Long Cold Winter album. Okay, he needs a throat lozenge. He, no, he, he, he definitely does. He growls the entire time because he can't sing, and that's, all, that's the only way he can get it. <laughs> but that music, the, the mixture between like, you know, the, the electric guitar and the acoustic guitar blending together, and they, they, the, oh, man, it's just so good. It's so good, and the songs are pretty that, good, too. Mr. Big did that. Um, freaking White Lion did that. Uh, white, what's it? Great White did that. All the white bands. <laughs> white Snake did that. All of them did it. Are you saying white music is a uh, combination of acoustic and electric guitars? <laughs> if you have white in the name of your band, you are mixing electric and acoustic. <laughs> I can't dispute that. That's, uh, <laughs> no, there's, yeah, that's accurate. <laughs> there's no arguing that. Oh, uh, is there anything in the white stripes? Oh, no. Oh, shit. There, too. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Even 20 years later, they're still doing it. Um, yep. Holy shit. This is going to be a great post show. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm looking forward to continuing the the music conversation in the post show. Uh, Hammond, for the for the audio listeners, 
Uh, this is going to bring us uh, to the wrap up of the show where we direct people to find more of what you do. Where would they go for that? So you can follow me on Twitter at Jay Hammond C. You can follow Climb Out at the Climb at let's see at Climb Out Network. I think I don't know. I don't follow that one. Well, maybe I do. Uh, climb Out Network. Uh, climb Out Network. Uh, climb Out Network dot com. Um, and then uh, uh, you can go to Jay Hammond C or Climb Out Network dot com, and we're all there. I mean. Beyond the playlist is there. Soundography at soundography.com. We're at the soundography on Twitter. And all and these, just, all these links will be in the show notes as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And I also, I also, you know, I do the booking for current geek. So, uh, since I've been almost doing it for almost two years now. So there is the one guy who came on, uh, he talked about his, his movie and his Kickstarter and he answered questions about land of the lost trivia and that was the that was my first booking, and I really thought that I wasn't going to be booking after that one. So, <laughs> luckily, luckily, I did better after that. Amazing. Oh, geez, uh, Kent, what about you, man? Where can people find uh, where where can be where can people go to find ways to ignore the things that you do online? Uh, that's a good way to put that. Uh, Twitter.com is a good place. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if you're interested in what I'm doing there, it's RM underscore Del Noche. I'm either Del Noche or Del Noche, Del Noche 77. Jeez. Uh, all over the internet. So find me on Twitch. Find me on uh, just absolutely everywhere. Uh, check me out. Amos, what about you, dude? Uh, Ethan Kane on Twitter because Ethan Kane makes sense with the name like Anthony Lemos and a nickname like Amos. That just goes right along with that. So just find me on Twitter at Ethan Kane. You can follow the show on Twitter at Ritual Misery. You can submit ideas. In our subreddit, ritualmisery.reddit.com. You can find all these links and more ways to support the show at ritualmisery.com. And you can uh, cruise on by... Oh, it's not on here. Ah, it changed. You can cruise on by twitch.tv slash ritualmisery at 7 p.m. Pacific time every Thursday. Uh, I'd like to thank you for listening, for Kent, for Hammond, for me, and for Kevin McLeod. This has been your Ritual Misery Podcast. See ya. Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>